If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 46, and let's look at verse 10. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Come on, let's all read it together. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. I'm talking about hearing the voice of God. Last week, I dealt with kind of a foundation that you and I are wired to hear the voice of God, that God has created us in a way that we can receive his voice, we can understand his voice, and we can obey his voice. There are movements that do not believe God speaks today, that once we had the foundation of the scriptures, the canon of the New Testament, then we were all done with, and now God only speaks through his word. Well, the primary way God speaks to us is through his word. I will say that. And anything else we hear must fit the boundaries of the word. Okay? We're not hearing stuff outside or contrary to his word. But God still speaks today by his spirit. God still speaks today. And I talked about this last week. God speaks by His Spirit. He speaks in many ways. He speaks through dreams and visions and prophetic words. And He speaks through counsel of people. He speaks through a lot of different ways. But I'm really trying to focus on just our personal relationship with God. And how does God speak to us on a personal level? Okay? So I just dealt with that last week. And this week I'm going to talk about being properly positioned so the Lord can speak to you being properly positioned so the Lord can speak with you. So I only have two things this morning. The first is from Psalm 46, be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. I think those two things are obviously connected literarily here, but I think they're connected logically. When we're still, then we're open to hearing the voice of God. Be still and know that that I am God. You know, I don't have to say it. It's, we all know this, but everyone is so busy today. Technology has basically worn us out. And we're in a point that we never really shut the phones off, TVs off, the news cycles, the everything is going, social media is cooking. Everything is just going at, at, and it's, it's at an ever increasing pace. And we're running at this pace like a hamster in the little wheel, you know. And we often don't take time just to listen to God and get quiet before Him and see what He would say to us. So I'm going to challenge you today to cut away some time every day just to spend with the Lord. If you're doing nothing, then anything's going to be good. Five minutes. Ten minutes. I'm going to give you a big challenge here this morning. 15 minutes. <laughs> Can you do 15 minutes and just cut away time to hear from the Lord? What am I going to do during that time, Hans? Well, you can sit quietly and think about Jesus. You can read Scripture. You can listen to Scripture on your phone. You can pray. You can pray in the Spirit. I, d just and it's going to look different for you probably than it does for me. Because I know each one of us kind of have our own personalities and our own ways of approaching the Lord. You know, I have friends that scream, yell, shout. I have friends that pray quietly. Uh, some days I'm on my face eating carpet. Other days I'm walking the floor. Other days I'm sitting in a chair drinking a cup of coffee. If you'll condition yourself to just spend some time before the Lord, then you'll open yourself to hearing His voice. And He may speak to you during that time, or He may speak to you while you're mowing the yard. It's interesting, Dallas Willard said, often when we come out of an intense time of prayer, you know, and if we, if we make that our, our lifestyle, then God will often speak to us when we're doing menial tasks. There's an, old, there's an ancient book, really, by a Brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. And in that book, this, this Catholic monk talked about how he just practiced God's presence and hearing God's voice through the little things of the day, washing the dishes, mopping the floor. So what? God can speak to you doing those things? 
Absolutely. You know, uh, I used this analogy earlier that I could take you to Washington, D.C. with me. And I could go, we could go to the National Mall. And on the National Mall, we could visit the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, walk by the reflecting pool, go to the World War II Memorial, walk the Smithsonian's all the way to the Capitol. And it's obviously all outdoors, and the pathways are graveled, right, with like, really with like some sort of rock. And every time I've walked those pathways, I've never thought about listening to my footsteps because it's always so busy. There's so many people milling around. There's voices. There's cars. There's sirens. There's people shouting. Everything. But a couple weeks ago, I was in the uh, Pisgah National Forest in Western Carolina at 4,000 feet hiking. And I was by myself, and I heard every footstep, every branch that broke, every little movement in the woods, because I was quiet and by myself and in a context that really dialed me into listening. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's difficult to hear God if you don't take some time and settle down and listen to his voice and, and really grow deeper, I'm going to use a term here, in your interior life. Amen. We're all about the external, what we do, what we produce, what we make, what we look like. what we. But God has given you an internal life. And you need to practice his presence on the inside. And as you do, you'll grow sharper and sharper and more acute in hearing his voice. Can we say amen? amen? Listen to some scripture. I'm teaching this morning, but it's better than me shouting down the house, okay? Because if you get this, it's going to, it's a one word from God can change your life. Amen. One word from the Lord can shift your entire direction. I know some of you need direction for your families. You need direction in your job. You need direction, decisions to make, maybe medically. You need decisions on, in your schooling. I mean, you need to hear the word of the Lord. And God has promised it to us. And I'm telling you, as you hear his voice, it's going to change your life. Well, I thought he only spoke to the preachers. Or he only spoke to the missionaries. No, he speaks to everyone who he's living inside of. If you're a born-again believer in here, you're a candidate to hear the voice of God. Okay, Just in the life of Jesus, notice this. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. At once the Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended to him. Jesus, to inaugurate his ministry, the Spirit led him into 40 days of solitude where he encountered Satan and overcame him and was encountering temptation and alone with the Father in the desert for 40 days. This would become a pattern. That was kind of a microcosm. It would become a pattern that he would follow the rest of his ministry. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And this was while everyone was looking for him. Mark 2.13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. We see him doing this over and over again. And I never thought anything about it. Maybe he's just going by the lake and he would teach by the lake. But sometimes I think he was going to the lake to get away from everybody. How many of y'all go to the lake to get away from everybody? Mark 3, 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. Luke 6, 12, Jesus went on a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him. So he went up and spent all night in prayer before calling and choosing the 12. But he was the son of God. He had the spirit without measure. Yes and amen. But he still went and spent all night in prayer before the Father before making a great big decision like that. 
You're hearing where I'm coming from, right? As my one friend said, I heard you when you pulled in the driveway. Matthew 13, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. And large crowds gathered around him. Then he got in a boat and sat in it. And while all the people stood on the shore there, he told them many things in parables. Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Mark 6.31, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Mark 7, 24, Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he couldn't keep his presence secret. He was trying to get away. Luke 9, 18, he went to Caesarea Philippi and was praying in private, and his disciples were with him, and he asked, who do the crowd say I am? Mark 9, 24, he takes Peter, James, and John to a solitary place on the mountain, and there he's transfigured before them. John 7, 10, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus also went up, not publicly, but in private. And the the thought here is that he walked 90 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem in silence and solitude. Five days. Luke 11, 1, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. So they were observing Jesus as he would go off privately And pray, and the disciples are saying, that's what we want. We want that prayer life like that. John 10, 39. Again, the religious leaders in Jerusalem sought to arrest Jesus, but he escaped their hands and he went away, probably walking about five miles across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. Mark 10, 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And so apparently Jesus kept silent again for a 22-mile hike because Luke says he was resolute in Luke 9, 51, meaning he was set with his face toward Jerusalem, and evidently he was silent. Mark 14, 26, when Jesus and his disciples had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives, which was his usual place to go and pray. Mark 14, 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane and he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. Why am I reading all these? Because often when I read the Gospels, I see all the action of Jesus. He's teaching people. He's casting out spirits. He's raising the dead. He's moving, 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 moving. And we often don't pick up on these small nuances in the text, which is that he had a lot of private and quiet time working between the lines. And, and my point is this, if Jesus required time to get away in solitude with the Father, if He required time to get away and pray before He made decisions, how much more should you and I try to cut away some time to get before the Father to be still and hear His voice? Dallas Willard said this. He said, many people say, I don't have time for extensive solitude and silence. I have too much to do. But the truth is, if you don't have time, the truth is, you don't have time not to practice solitude and silence. Because no time is more profitably spent than that used to heighten your quality of the intimate walk you have with God. If we think otherwise, we've been badly educated. Willard said the real question is, will we take time to do what is necessary for an abundant life because we cut out time for what we value? We cut out time for what we value. Hey, would you like to get together on Thursday night? No, dude, that's when uh, my favorite TV show comes on. (laughs) And it's fine. But you're cutting out time for what you value. Or no, 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 I have, uh, you know, I always play golf on Thursdays. Golf's great. You're cutting out time for what you value. I respect that. But are you doing the same for getting before the presence of the Lord? If you value His presence, then cut away some time. I'm preaching, I've preached it, I've run it over and vacuuming over and over again now, right? (laughs) Willard said this, he said, first of all, God never gives us too much to do. We do that to ourselves. 
guilty. Second, the exercise of God's power in ministry never by itself amends character, okay, or adds to character, or it, it rarely makes up for our own foolishness. God's power can be actively and wisely sought and received by us only as we seek to grow in grace. So what he's saying is that power with Christ should be matched with character. If you have character and no power, you're not going to be as effective as you should be. If you have power and no character, you're going to fail at some point, like Saul or like Samson. What we want is power with God and Christ-likeness in character. And those things come by spending time in His face, spending time in His Word, spending time meditating on God, cutting out some quiet time. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. So I'm going to challenge you this week. Take a few minutes a day, 15, and get before His presence. Hallelujah. Maybe it's in that favorite lazy boy. Maybe it's on the back porch. Maybe it's driving to work. Shut everything down. I don't know. See if your life won't be transformed by it. I think it was Martin Luther who said, when I have a real busy day, then I just get up an hour earlier so I can really spend time before his presence. Because how many times do we get up in the morning and we think, oh gosh, I'm, 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 I don't have time to pray today. i got to get going, you know. But if you just spend, I've noticed even cutting just a, just, just a little bit of time out and getting before his face, it changes the fabric of the whole day. And I never know what's going to happen. So I go in, you know, I'll go in my prayer room and I'll, I'll get in there. And some days it's like, okay, I'm going to go through some prayers and we'll read the, some Psalms. And okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to say some prayers and thank you. It's like working out, you know, okay, thank you, Lord. And I leave. Other days it hits me and all of heaven opens up. I'm laid eating carpet before the Lord crying my eyes out. Some days I'm in warfare, praying in the Holy Spirit. So, you know, but none of that would be possible if I didn't cut away time. Okay, somebody shout amen. Shout it out. Be still. Be still. Second thing, it's going to sound weird, but listen to this. Watch to hear. Watch to hear. Listen, the book of Habakkuk says in chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. Okay, let's break this down. I will take time and get in his presence. I will stand my watch. I'm going to set myself on the rampart. And I'm going to watch to see what he'll say. And this term in Hebrew to watch, it means to peer, peer onward or lean forward. I'm going to lean into this thing to see what God is saying to me. Okay, I think, it's, I think it's interesting, both vision, watching, and what he will say to me in words. Watch and hear, or watch to hear. Oh, hallelujah. Then, and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it. I'm going to say this. God speaks in many different ways. Some of them I'll deal with next week. Some of them I'm just going to leave for you to discover. But I'm going to give you two things out of this in your personal prayer time and your personal devotions. Number one, God speaks through vision. God speaks through vision. God gives you pictures of things and images, and I'm going to use this term, that will appear in your mind's eye. And I think that's how we see in the Spirit. It appears in your mind's eye. And that's how God shows us things in the Spirit. Because we often think from Scripture, well, these prophets saw things, but oh my gosh, they were prophets. Or some of the ministers Hans has come in and speak, boy, they see things, but boy, they're nationally known ministers. Well, you know what? God can show you things. God shows you stuff by vision. You have the same capacity in you because deep calls in the deep at the noise of your water spouts, the psalmist said. Spirit calls to spirit. He's spirit. We're spirit. And he speaks to us by the spirit. Am I an expert at this? 
No. Am I trying? Yes. Do I want to be better? Yes. Yes. Do I want y'all to get it? Yes. I'm just telling you, God speaks by vision sometimes. He will just show you pictures of things. Most of my examples are from ministry because I've been preaching for 30 some years. So I'm going to give you some examples from ministry. So I'm preaching at a church several years ago and I'm praying for a guy and I just see an image in my mind, just in my mind's eye. I see an image of someone digging a grave with a shovel. And so I'm trying to be super spiritual prophet man. And I'm thinking this is type and shadow and God's showing me. So, so I said, someone's digging a grave. I see it now. Boom. And then I started praying for him and just added to what I was feeling. Well, come to find out, someone looked at me and said, oh my gosh, his dad just died. And I said, okay, hold on, Lord. God was showing me as a picture in my mind's eye, a reality of what was going on in his life. I didn't have to be super spiritual. I didn't have to add to some big prophetic word. I just had to tell him because I think God gives word of knowledge and pictures sometimes so it will add to or increase the faith of the person you're ministering to. I believe that's what he does. He really shows you something in their life so it opens their heart so now he can do what he wants to in their life. I've got many examples like that of me ministering in church to people. And it will often happen for some reason when I travel as an evangelist and pray for people in altar calls. And I don't know people. And I'll just start seeing things and I've learned to just say what I see and go on. And sometimes it's absolutely mind-boggling and the person really gets great revelation through what God is showing me. I think the same thing happens with our own personal lives too. God gives us glimpses and God gives us pictures. You know, Paul said in the book of Corinthians that we see in part and we know in part. He said there's going to come a day when we're not going to need prophecy anymore. There's going to come a day when we're not going to need tongues anymore. There's coming a day when we won't need knowledge anymore. Why? Because Jesus himself is going to come back and he's going to be all of that to us. But now we need knowledge, we need tongues, we need prophecy. But all of those things work in partial manner. So we don't see everything. God doesn't go, okay, Hans, I see that you're starting to walk with me. Here's the blueprint for your life for the next 50 years. If he did that, I would go instantly to the back of the book and it would freak me completely out. So what God does is he says, here's a picture. Oh, thank you, Lord. And it reveals I'm doing the right thing or something God wants to show me or the next step in my journey. Then he shows me another picture and it's the next step in the journey. And God leads us like headlights on an automobile. How many's ever driven in the fog or in the blowing snow? I grew up in the mountains with a lot of snow. You just drive and you just keep on going and sometimes you can't see six feet in front of you, but you just keep going and as you go, it gets brighter and brighter. Listen to this, Genesis 5.1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, so Abram had a vision and the Lord said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I wonder how that vision happened. Because I guess I've always thought with well, the Bible characters, they saw a vision like this. They saw a huge screen on the edge of their tent and God played it out like a movie or God showed up physically. But I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking more and more they saw God like you and I see God. They saw vision like we see vision. God appeared to them and God started speaking. Listen to a few more here. 2 Samuel 7, 7, 17. According to all these words and according to all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Now, if you remember the story of King David, he fell into adultery and then he just kind of, he kind of tried to cover it up by having the girl's husband killed in battle and then he tried to cover it up. He married her, took her in, everything's hunky-dory until the prophet walked in. 
And God had shown the prophet all that had been going down. And now we see in chapter 7 how God showed the prophet. He showed Nathan in vision. I don't know. I just think Nathan was seeing this. And God was showing it to him. And then he went and acted on it. I was with a minister recently having dinner. And this guy said, Hans, and, and, and I, didn't know, I, don't, I didn't know he was all that much of a spiritual guy. I mean, I knew he was a preacher, but... He said, Hans, I was taking a shower. And the Lord said, go visit your friend. He's in adultery. And the Lord showed it to me. I said, wow. He said, so I flew to another state and confronted him. And they denied it. And then they confessed all of it. God showed him in the shower. And it was his friend who he went to help restore. Oh, hallelujah. God can show you things, folks. Some, one man said, God always speaks to me when I'm jogging. And another guy said, it's because the only time you shut up. <laughs> God speaks in the shower because you're not talking to anyone. You know, driving the truck because you're... Your mind's on, you're quiet, you know. He speaks in vision. Listen to Acts, Acts 18, 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, and he said, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. So at night in a vision, was this a dream? Well, it didn't say it was a dream. It said it was in, at the night in a vision. Acts 9, at 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision... Ananias. He says, here am I, Lord. He speaks to him in vision form. Paul said in Acts twenty two seventeen. 17, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, and I was in a trance. That's another way God can speak to you, but he's caught up in the Spirit and starts seeing things. Let me ask you to do something. And this is, uh, this is a step of faith in me even asking this. As you spend time before the Lord, write down the things you start seeing. Just write them down. If you see something, you feel it might be of God, just write it down. I remember, God will show you things. We were at dinner with a pastor I preached for years ago in Central Virginia, and he was having a problem with someone in his leadership. And we were sitting there at table, and my wife Jackie said, your problem is a lady, she's seeing a man, this is what he looks like, and he wears a big necklace that looks exactly like this. And the pastor went, oh my gosh, how did you know that? Jackie just saw it sitting at lunch. It just came into her mind's eye, and I saw her do that many times with things. Just seeing vision, oh hallelujah. Write it down. And then I'm going to encourage you to get with someone you can trust who's a spiritual person that you can share these things with. Because what I see a lot of people do is they start seeing things or hearing things, and then God has spoken to me, and they go for it full bore, overdrive, and they won't listen to any counsel or any correction over them. And then I've seen a lot of people crash and burn over what they felt God has spoken to them because they're not allowing someone to minister to them and share this thing. Even Paul said when prophetic word is given, it should be judged. So someone gives you a prophetic word, you can rejoice in it, but brother, you better judge that word too. Because there's a lot of false prophecy flowing around. Did I just say that? God speaks in vision. Second way He will speak is through a spontaneous flow of thoughts. God speaks in words and He gives you a flow in the Spirit and it comes and you'll hear it and not necessarily hearing it audibly. I'm talking hearing it in your spirit. And what's it sound like? Sounds like thoughts in your head. And that blows my mind because everything I have to do, I have to figure out and put through this gray matter right here because i got all this education. 
<laughs> and education's good. But it's like, oh, Lord. And then God wants to speak some things, and I'm here discerning and filtering and looking through the different lenses and trying to figure it all out. And I, I'm because we've been taught to be cognitive people. We're taught that in the Western world. All the West works on cognitive logic, and that's the way we're taught. But God doesn't speak that way. He speaks through a flow of words. It comes through our mind, but it's not dependent on our logic. Drop the mic on that. Because God, I mean, now I think everything God does is ultimately logical to mystic, to mystic philosophy from the 1200s. But... It may not seem that way to us at first, or it may seem contrary to what we think is good, but God starts speaking stuff, and it's just going to come in a flow of thoughts. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. And this is when life change comes, folks. I'm telling you, God starts speaking in a flow of thoughts. Let me give you an example. I've told this about 10,000 times, and I hope I tell it a million more before I leave here. I was 16, and I wasn't serving Jesus. I was put in a hospital room because I got very sick at 16 years old. I missed about a month of school. I went into a hospital in my hometown of Grundy, Virginia, the old Grundy Hospital. I was there under the care of my uncle who was a doctor. And at night, one night, all of a sudden, a voice spoke to me. It wasn't audible. It was just a flow of thoughts that came out of my heart, not the, not the pumping organ heart, but heart in the ancient sense, the center of my spiritual being. And these words may sound weird to you, but it's exactly what I heard. Hans, you don't have to party anymore. I was just thinking about getting older and partying. I went home a few weeks later. I'm at my mom and dad's. I'm walking down the hallway. Hallway. A, the voice speaks again, not audibly, but that flow of thoughts in the inner person. And the voice said this, the world's coming to an end. You better get in church. How's that for a seeker-sensitive sermon? And I thought, oh my gosh. So you know what I did? I walked in my mom and dad's bedroom. They weren't serving the Lord. They didn't go to church. But I remembered, for some strange reason, they had purchased a copy of the Bible and had it laying on their nightstand. And it wasn't, you know, it was the living Bible paraphrase packaged in the 80s in a paperback form called the book. I picked up the book and took it to my bedroom. And I went to the first page for that Bible reading for dummies 101 because I didn't know anything about the Bible. And it says, if you've never read the Bible before, do this. Go to the Gospel of Mark and start reading. It's fast-paced. Uses the word immediately so many times. 16 chapters, probably written for a Roman action-packed audience. I went to Mark. I began reading. And all of a sudden, Jesus leapt off the page. The scriptures came alive. I fell down at my bedside and gave my heart to Jesus. That's how I got saved. Nobody preached to me. I didn't attend church, didn't read a gospel track, didn't listen to gospel music, surely didn't watch gospel preachers on TV. God spoke to me by His Spirit through a flow of thoughts that hit me two times, one in the hospital and one after I got out that completely changed my life and changed the trajectory of my life forever. That's what hearing the Word of the Lord can do for you. So I'm at home and I'm praying some time later, uh, maybe a few years later, I'd been in church and been on fire and been helping my pastor and been involved in ministry. And all of a sudden I hear the Lord speak to me. And, it, and again, it was a flow of thoughts. It wasn't audible. It came as thoughts in my mind. And I heard this. Open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. So I opened my Bible to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And it said, I will give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I knew that it was a word from the Lord. 
I knew it was a confirmation from God. I felt the calling to preach. I was like, every time someone preached it, just like, ah, I just get fired up. And, and then my pastor was encouraging me too. And then this was like the icing on the cake when I heard this flow of thought hit me and it went right to the scripture. Now, you know, I don't know. I know it was a word from the Lord. I'm not necessarily teaching you just open the Bible and where it lays, that's the word God has for you. That can go wrong. Like the one businessman who needed help in his business and he was desperately praying, so he opened the Bible and he just let it fall, fall where it may and he read chapter 13. <laughs> which is bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. Or like the guy who said, Jesus hung himself. Next scripture. Go thou and do likewise. You don't want to do that. Anyhow. <laughs> but God can give you words like that. He can speak in a spontaneous flow of thought as you condition yourself in prayer and meditation, being still and waiting on the Lord. Listen to this. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Elijah was on the mountain and God had spoken. He had seen God move in earthquakes. He had seen God move in uh, fire from heaven being fallen. He saw, saw God move uh, on Mount Horeb and killing all the prophets of Baal. But he came evidently in a different form on the Mount Carmel, which was, or Mount Horeb here, which was a still small voice. And God spoke out of that still small voice and didn't answer any of his gripes and complaints. But God said, here's what I want you to do, son. I want you to stand up and I want you to go and I want you to anoint the next generation of leaders. Because when you hear the voice of God, it's going to affect the next generation. I'm telling you, it's going to affect the next generation. What I heard from the Lord has affected how my daughters have been raised completely what you hear from God's going to affect them and then their kids are going to be affected by the decisions I made based on what I was hearing in my prayer time from the Lord can somebody shout amen, amen. oh hallelujah Exodus chapter 20 here's the ten commandments ten commandments and God spoke all these words to Moses how did Moses get the ten commandments God speaking to him David, 1 Samuel 23, then they told David saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Calah and they're robbing in the threshing floors. What did David do? He went and inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go attack the Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go attack the Philistines and save Calah. Go do it. I've now spoken to you to go. Maybe I told this last week, but if so, hear it again. Oral Roberts was a 17-year-old young boy in Oklahoma dying of tuberculosis. He collapsed on a basketball court. They took him home and he got worse and worse and worse. And finally, his brother came and got him and picked him up, loaded him in the car and took him to a tent meeting. And at the tent meeting was an unknown preacher preaching this tent meeting. And on the way, Oral said he heard the voice of God, spontaneous flow of thoughts. He heard God say, take my healing power to this generation, build for me a university where the students learn to hear my voice. He went, they laid hands on him. He was miraculously healed at 17 of tuberculosis, gone instantly. And then he became what he became, arguably one of the greatest healing ministers of our time. And built a university where tens of thousands and tens of thousands of people have gone all over the globe, some of the greatest ministers in the 20th century, preaching the gospel, all because one man heard a flow of thoughts from the Lord and recognized it as God. I don't know what happened in 1919, but there was a couple that came out of Norfolk, the Edges, Edge was their last name. They had planted a string of churches, this couple had. And they came to Elizabeth City 
And they planted a church in 1919 called the First Pentecostal Holiness Church of Elizabeth City. I don't know the story behind their journey, but I'm thinking somewhere they heard something. Somewhere they heard something in prayer. They heard something while driving down the road. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what they were driving in 1919. <laughs> Maybe they were riding a horse down the road. I don't know. But they came to this city and they planted this church. And now 102 years later, you and I are living in this context and in this environment because somebody had a word way back then. You don't know what is on the other side of the door of your obedience to what God speaks to you. Or in a negative way, you don't know what's on the other side of the door of your disobedience. And what tragedy can come to you and your family. But I'm telling you what, I know, this, the reason I'm preaching this is I was at a pastor's conference in Nashville a couple months ago. It was a huge conference. I spoke a morning session, but I'm at dinner with one of the other speakers that I didn't even stay to hear. But I'm at dinner with this guy. He's brilliant. He's on boards and committees with big time people in the world. <laughs> And he said, there's stuff coming on the earth. He said, there's 11 other variants following the Delta variant of COVID. There's possible dirty bombs coming in cities of the United States that our generals are already prepared for. There's a $700 trillion stock market crash coming. Blah, 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 on, on, on. He said these things, and I'm like, and I went to him privately, and I said, what am I to do? I'm pastoring a church. Because I can't get my mind on that stuff. If I get my, I got to get my mind in the word and not on fear. And he looked at me though, and he said something that's been ringing in my ears ever since. He said, those who know the voice of the spirit will survive. Teach your church how to listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Oh man, I felt that. Those who listen to the voice of the spirit will survive. Listen to the voice of the spirit for your family. What God tells you to do for your family, do it. Amen. God tells you to get something ready, get something ready. God tells you to move, you move. God tells you to shift jobs, you shift jobs. You'll obey the word of the Lord. It's better than obeying the voice of Hans. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do that, and God's, it's going to be all right. They were in, and one more thing, we're going to pray, but Paul was in the, the Eurachlidon storm, you know, in Acts, the latter part of Acts, and... Uh, he had told the guys, hey guys, we're going to be in trouble if we do this. They ignored him. And then they get in the storm and he stood up and he said, you know what? I got a word. An angel stood by me last night. He said, there's going to be some problems. Y'all are going to walk through some problems, but not one person is going to be lost. This is what the nation needs. Some people who can stand up and say, I've heard the word of the Lord. I've heard the word of the Lord and we're going to make it. This is the way we're going through. Jesus is still Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not caving to any of this garbage I hear. Jesus is still Lord. Bible's still right. Hell's still real. Heaven's still hot. Righteousness is still right. Holiness is still the way to live. Hallelujah. God still speaks. God still heals. God heals COVID. I've heard people coming off ventilators by the Holy Ghost because somebody prayed for them. I've heard of people casting it out of their lives. Come on, I don't know. I'm, this is, come on, somebody. God is still in the miracle working business. He said, I am God. Hallelujah. And I change not. I am God and I change not. He's still in control. He can speak to you. He can shift your situation. He can get your kids out of that problem they're in. He can heal the ADHD and he can heal the, everything that you got going on. He can turn your life around and set your church on fire, set your house on fire, set your business on fire. God can do everything he said he's going to do. Come on, somebody give him a shout. Hallelujah. Come on, just stand to your feet and say, God, here I am. Your servant listens, God. Here I am and your servant is listening, God. I'm listening for your voice, God. Oh, hallelujah. Speak, Lord. Father, I pray that you clear out the debris in our lives so we can hear you. God, forgive us for getting too busy to listen to your voice. Forget, forgive us, God, for putting too many things in the way between you and us, Lord. And God, we just consecrate ourselves afresh and we say, God, we want to hear you. 
We want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speak, Lord. God, we need you. Lord, set your word on fire with us, God. When we read it, let it not just be dry, dead letter, but let it be living. Let it be like fire in us, God. And when we read, then illuminate it and speak to us, God. Oh, hallelujah. And we give you praise right now, Lord. We give you praise right now, Lord. We give you praise right now, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, some people believe that God doesn't speak every moment and every day and all that. And I've debated this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I can tell you a handful of times I know God has specifically spoken and changed the destiny of my life. But is He speaking every day? I'm going to say He can speak every day. Last story. Doug Eccles, who we all know, went to Haiti several years ago. And when he landed, he had hotel reservations at a hotel that had multiple stories. He told me, he said, Hans, I got in a taxi and I just felt a little something in my heart. And I said, I asked the taxi driver, I said, listen, could you take me to another hotel and see if they have any rooms? The guy said, yeah, sure. So they went to this other hotel. This other hotel was not a multi-story building. It was individual bungalows. So he said, we got there, put our luggage in the room, went out and just sat down. They had a pool. We sat down by the pool and all of a sudden an earthquake happened. He said, the water in the pool stood up and fell back down. And within a matter of a few seconds, Haiti was completely devastated. Over 100,000 died. It was absolutely catastrophic what happened. And the hotel that he had originally planned to stay in collapsed. He said, I just heard a check in my spirit, a small thing, and it saved his life. How important is it for us to learn to hear the voice of God? Thank you so much for joining us online. And I hope the message was a real blessing to you. You know, eternity is a real thing. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. According to the scriptures, you spend eternity in one of two places. First of all, heaven. Paul said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Or number two, in hell. Jesus talked about the rich man who went to hell and was in great torment. And he was begging Abraham to send someone, a messenger, to tell his family. Well, listen, you're hearing the message today. Eternity is real, and you're going to spend it in one of two places. So why don't let's decide right now, me and you, that you're going to spend it in heaven. How do you do that? You accept Jesus into your heart. Open up your heart and say, Lord, come in. Cleanse me of all sin. I accept you as my Lord and take the throne of my life as yours. Okay? So let's pray right now. Just pray with me right where you are. Just repeat this. Father in heaven, I, I remove myself from the throne of my heart. And Jesus, I invite you to sit on the throne of my heart. Forgive me of all sin. Wash me in your precious blood. And I accept your sacrifice for me. And I thank you, Lord for cleansing me, for saving me, and for accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Can you say amen right where you're at? Hey, thank you for joining us. And please come back, get in, get in the Word, get in the flow of the Spirit. And uh, we're just blessed to have you with us and look forward to seeing you the next time.